Hello everyone, uh, this is John Buck. I'm back with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and in this video, we're going to talk about the eigenfunction property of linear time invariant systems. That eigenfunction is a big, German, scary sounding word, uh, but the idea is actually pretty simple. What the, the eigenfunction property says is that if my input to an LTI system is a complex exponential, the output will be the same exponential scaled by a constant gain. I may have different gains and often will have different gains for different exponential inputs, but it makes it very easy to find the output for the in, find the output of the system uh, when when the input is an exponential. And the really impressive useful thing about this is that this property holds for any exponential input and for any LTI system. All I need to know is that the system is LTI. So that's a really broadly applicable property. So in this video, I'll show you where that comes from, how it comes right out of the convolution sum, and then show you an example of how we might use this to find the output uh, when the input is an exponential. All right, again, so my, my topic for today is the eigenfunction property of LTI systems. And then again, what we'll see uh, is this is about exponential inputs. So the idea of eigenfunctions right, is that for uh, any, this is this remarkable fact that for any LTI system, You'd say, well, x of n equals z to the n. Going, If my input is a complex exponential, so if I can write my input just as z to the n for all time, that's, and that all time is important, my output, y of n, will be the same z to the n multiplied by a constant gain that we write h of z because this is uh, okay. this does not depend on n. Right, it's got to be a, a constant with respect to time, but it may get different gain for different z. So if I change the exponential coming in, the gain that I see on that exponential may be different. But that's pretty incredible. That says for this kind of system, every LTI system just scales it, right? All it does is multiply it up or down, uh, regardless of, of what the Z of N is and regardless of what the LTI system is. You would be right to be skeptical of such a broad claim. So let me uh, address your skepticism and, and, and hopefully convince you by showing you how this just comes out of the convolution sum, right? We know we've only got one way so far to find the output for an LTI system, which is to say the, the output is a convolution of the, the impulse response with the system. So let me look at what's going on here. I can, I'm going to write this version of the convolution where I get h of k, x of n minus k. And then I'm going to plug in my, uh, my input here for x of n minus k, right? So if I plug that in, then n minus k all the n's get replaced by n minus k. I have h of k, z to the n minus k. And now if I look at this, I say, well, I can use properties of exponentials to say z to the n minus k is z to the n times z to the minus k. And so I can write it that way, and then I can pull the z to the n out front because it's independent of the sum. And all of a sudden, I'm looking pretty close to the result I was trying to get to, which is I can say this is z to the n. And I'm going to put all the rest of this inside parentheses here. What I have left inside is the sum as k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of h of k, z to the minus k. Right, and now... If I scroll down a little bit, I say, well, 
that thing in brackets is independent of n. So this is a constant with respect to time. So we can just call it maybe a function of z. That's what I meant earlier when I said we'll have different gains for different z's. But as a function of time, it doesn't change. So I can just say whatever exponential I put in, I get out the same exponential scaled by h of z. And so that's a really powerful result that, that comes out of this. Uh, and one we're going to use over and over and over again. But let me start by, by showing you uh, an example of using it uh, just for a very simple way of how I find that h of z and then how it lets me find the output. Uh, so let me, uh, I have this example here where if my impulse response is this signal here, which I should have made a sketch ahead of time, but this is a signal that would be a zero for negative time, and then it'll have uh, maybe height four here at time zero, height three at time one, and then two and one. And so this is my, my h of n. And then I have this input that actually goes on forever in both directions. So that would be tricky to find the convolution. I could plug it into the sum and try to use uh, properties of deltas and things like that. And I could get an answer for it. But it, it might take me a while to see how it's just the same thing by a constant. But instead, I'm going to, to use that, that equation I had a minute ago where I said, well, h of z is the sum as k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of uh, h of k z to the minus k. So let me plug my h of n in here. Right, I'm going to take this and plug it in here. And when I do that, I have the sum as k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of 4 delta of k plus 3 delta of k minus 1 times z to the minus k. And now I can just say, well, I can just look through these and for each say, well, when is this non-zero, right? One of the reasons that deltas are easy to work with is they only have one value where they're not equal to zero, right? When k equals zero, the first one will be one. So when k equals zero, I get four times z to the minus zero, and I get plus three times the second term. This term here is only non-zero when k equals one. So this only happens at k equal, this is only matters at k equals zero. This term only matters at k equals one. And so this one will be three times, the second term will be three times z to the minus one. Well, z to the minus zero is going to be one. So I have four plus three z to the minus one. So this tells me, if you tell me the exponential, I can tell you what the gain will be, right? So we know I want this to be, if I look at my system up here, I've got, z equals 3, right? Looking at this here, my exponential input is 3 to the n, so z equals 3. So that tells me I need to evaluate h of z at z equals 3. So that's equal to 4 plus 3 times 3 to the minus 1 power. So that's 3 over 3. So this is uh, 4 plus 1, which is 5. So this says the gain of this system when the input is the exponential 3 to the n, the gain of the system will be 5. So this output will be h of z evaluated at z equals 3 times 3 to the n, which we just solved for this piece here. Right, so I now take this back up here and say this output will be 5 times 3 to the n. So if I put 3 to the n in, I'll get out 5 times 3 to the n uh, for my output. So that's an example of using the eigenfunction property. Um, if I'm going to add a postscript here about where the name eigenfunction comes from that might be helpful if you've had linear algebra. If you haven't had linear algebra, just stop here. I've said all the things that are going to be useful to you, and, and I'll just put up the end credits. But if you, if you have linear algebra background and you're curious about this, I'll, I'll, I'll have a brief comment about why we call this an eigenfunction.
All right, so if you're still with me, I'm going to assume you know a little bit about eigenfunct uh, linear algebra. And one of the, the things that's important in, in linear algebra, right, is the, what we call an eigenvector, right? The definition of an eigenvector, we say, you know, for, for a matrix, matrix A has an eigenvector V, If, right, we have a, well, we're going to talk about right eigenvalue, right eigenvectors for now. A times b is lambda v. So that if I multiply that vector by an eigenvector by the matrix, I get the same vector again, just scaled. And so this is starting to seem like suspiciously similar to what we just talked about. Imagine if I let, <clears throat> it's the same idea, except instead of just multiplying by a matrix for a finite size vector, imagine I let the vector, the matrix get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so it, the matrix, as it goes to infinity, would be like a, an LTI system that operates on X of N for all infinity. So in some ways, we're, we're saying we can turn the signal X of N into an infinite column vector, right? And in some not... We're not going to get, I don't want to get precise into limits and infinity. I'm more after conceptual ideas here. But I could just stack up all the values over all time going to infinity in both directions, right? And, and, and conceptually say, well, yeah, I could imagine having some infinite vector here that's multiplied by some matrix H that is implementing the LTI system. And what we're saying is what I'll get back is the same vector x scaled by some constant. Well, this is, and the constant I'll get scaled by is, is h of z. And this comes down to the remarkable fact that if I have what's called a circulant matrix, a matrix that would be made up of all the shifted impulse responses, I would get uh, anything that's an, an exponential vector would, would uh, turn in, or any exponential vector, or what's sometimes called a Vandermond vector, if you've heard that name, multiplied by a circulant matrix gives me back the same exponential vector scaled by a constant. And so we've gone from vectors that are finite length to functions that are infinitely, but the eigen has still stayed around. So that's why that we're called eigenfunctions. It's sort of just one step up from a really big vector to an infinite vector and, and from multiplying by a matrix to a linear operator, if, if you've seen those ideas. That might be helpful. If not, you probably should have paused the visit video about three minutes ago. But for some people, that connection is useful. All right, so I will uh, see you next time.